Well, good morning and welcome to Garland Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're very glad that you're here and we will all gather together this morning and rejoice in the Lord. As usual, we're going to start this morning with singing our praises and worship to the Lord. Uh, I've been a little extra busy uh, lately with the technology around here, trying to figure it all out and get the streaming thing a little bit more smooth than it has been. So we decided it would be a great week to um, pick some videos from, from things that we've done in the last four months now. And you are going to get to hear from myself and Brandon and Debbie and Eric. It's kind of a mashup of worship this morning. But I do want to encourage you that even though it looks different and it may feel different and sound different this morning, that whenever we enter into worship of the Lord, it's by choice. So it's not something that just happens when the music's extra good and the lights are just the right brightness. It's a choice that we make when we come and we slow down and we turn our hearts and our minds to the Lord. So I'd encourage you this morning to do that. We also get to hear a great update from our missionaries that we support in Ecuador, the Eason's. We get a special treat after that, and Paul Tapp has put his creative mind to work again. And um, there's some information he's going to give us about a traveling opportunity that you can take part in. And then last, but certainly not least, we'll be hearing from Paul Tapp. He has been digging into 1 Samuel along with Rod and the rest of the teaching team, Joanna and Lynn and myself, and he has a message to bring to you today. So let's um, hear what the Lord has to teach us through Paul. Before we pray and then worship this morning, just want to remind you that you can go to our website, garlandchurch.org slash give to give your offering. Garland, you have been amazingly faithful. Thank you so much. I feel like I keep saying that every single week, and we are thankful, thankful, thankful for that. So that's, that's all you guys. Also, don't forget that on August 23rd, we are having a worship night and gathering here. This will be the first one. I know you are all very excited to get to see everyone face to face again. It'll be Sunday evening um, at 6 p.m., so mark your calendars with that. And I do want to remind you, though, that we are choosing to follow the mandate from the governor. And even though we're outside, we're going to choose to wear masks to, to honor that and to love each other. So bring your mask and come Sunday the 23rd to worship and to gather in fellowship. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. We want to come to you, Lord. We want to worship. We want to pray. We want to thank you and praise you. And Lord, we want to learn from you. So we ask that, Lord. Would you help us to set aside the burdens and the things that keep us tied up, Lord, to confess them, to give them to you, to seek freedom in you. And Lord, as we hear from your word, would we seek to be renewed by the transforming of our minds? that we may become more like you, Lord. So I pray that this morning that we enter into your presence, that we turn our hearts to you. Thank you, Lord. You are so very good to us. In your holy and precious name, amen. Breath that 
once could make every king bow down. Who else can whisper in darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such presence? What other splendor shines the sun what other majesty rules with justice only a holy God come and behold him the one and the only Christ Consumes like fire. What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and behold. Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father?
your love, oh Lord. Riches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Garland Church. We are Will and Amanda Eason, and we are missionaries in Monta with Inca Link International. Inca Link represents Envision in most of Latin America, and that's how we got to know your church. Uh, you guys sent a team down in 2015 uh, to work alongside of us. And in 2016, Amanda and I started a ministry called Bonsai. It's an after-school program that's directed at latchkey kids from low-income families, and we focus on three areas specifically. One, on education as a means to break cycles of poverty. We focus on developing healthy families, so forming ally relationships with parents and giving them the freedom and the means to be able to go out and work to take care of their own kids and their own needs. And then through all of that, we're pointing people to Jesus. We want people to have the hope that can be found in Christ, and then to be able to be baptized and discipled, connected through the local church. So that's a really basic outline of what we do. If you want to learn more, you can check out our website at bonsai, B-O-N-S-A-I, hyphen Ecuador.org. We want to give you guys an update of what ministry looks like in the middle of a pandemic. Ecuador was hit really hard with a lot of cases at the beginning, but the Ecuadorian government has implemented some really strict measures uh, to try to, to stop the spread. Uh, they've put in curfews, uh, limited the days, and still are limiting the days in which we can drive based on our uh, license plate number, and masks are not optional. Um, these strict measures have helped um, uh, with consequences up to jail time if you don't follow them. 
We've also recently been able to return back to Ecuador. We were stuck in the U.S. for five months due to a travel ban that had been put in place due to COVID. Uh, we returned and did our two-week quarantine at home and are excited now about able to be leaving and being able to get back to ministry here in Ecuador. So before the beginning of the pandemic, we had kids at the after school program five days a week. We've had to be a little bit more creative because we can't physically get together in the way that we did before. So one of the major ways that we're helping is by buying and uh, then distributing food to the families that are involved. A lot of the parents have not been able to work as a result of the pandemic. And so that's been a big help to them. And it also allows us to remain connected with the kids and the families. So we're taking them some basic things like rice, lentils, eggs, so detergent, things like that to help them in this time. School also started back here a little over two months ago, uh, all online. And this is difficult for everyone, but especially those, uh, some of those in our program who don't have access to the things that they need. So during this time, we've not been able to gather all of our group, but what we've been doing is bringing the kids with the biggest needs to the church, our ministry center, and been able to work with them individually. Uh, this one family in particular we're helping, they don't have a phone, internet, a computer, and the parents can't even read or write. And so we've been working uh, really hard with them several days a week to try to help them to catch up and not fall behind any farther than they already were. We've also been working with our church. I'm one of the interim pastors here at our local church, Iglesia Biblica Bautista de Manta. So even while we were in the States, have still been able to stay connected, preaching through Facebook Live, meeting with the other leaders through Zoom. Uh, Amanda has been working with and leading, uh, helping to lead a women's Bible study, been working with the university group temporarily, uh, helping to lead a study there on Friday nights. And then recently, now that we're back, have been able to start back with some in-home uh, discipleship classes with some families. For example, there's one of our families uh, in Bonsai. The parents came to know the Lord just before we left, and we had started classes, and so now we've been able to jump back in uh, to that with them. On top of that, uh, we've also become teachers this year of our own two kids. We have a daughter, Sayla, who's four, and a son, Emery, who's nine. And we've been helping them with online classes and doing a lot of more homework. Uh, it can be frustrating at times, but um, we've also been grateful for the opportunity to invest more in our own kids. It's not necessarily how we would have planned things out, but uh, we're grateful to be able to focus on our own kids and focus on the opportunity and the time that we have with them. So Garland, we want to thank you for supporting our family's ministry. And if anybody has any questions or wants to find out more, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. Bye. Coming up next, today's sermon. Today's message is brought to you by On the Run, Need a Place to Hide Out. Escaping from a psychotic king mad with jealousy? Then you need a Rick Reeves Middle East hideaway tour. Where do you run when you're on the run? I'll show you. Cliffs are good. Caves are even better. You never know who you'll run into. And some bloke, I'd say. This here is one of my personal favorites. And so many more. Who are to see them all? Contact me at ReevesOnTheRun.com and give it a go, mate. Don't forget to order some of my special bottled Oasis water. Gotta stay hydrated. If you're living on the lamb, call 1-800-RUN-FAST. Certain conditions apply. Talk to your doctor before attempting. Rick Reeves not responsible for lost luggage or injured tourists. Water and snacks provided for an extra fee. Lots of other hidden fees will be included in your final bill. Well, good morning. Uh, I don't know about you, but the guy in that commercial looked kind of familiar for those of us at Garland. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute who he looks like. Well, welcome to the continuing saga of David and King Saul. And as that ad said, David could have used a lot of places to hide out, and he did, because at this point of his life, he was having to move around and 
live in a way that he really didn't want to. Does that sound familiar? Because of his circumstances. He was playing a deadly game of hide and seek with King Saul. Saul at this point was obsessed with, well, we have to say it, killing David because he had all these conspiracy theories in his mind that David was out to take his kingship. And so Saul was after him. David was a fugitive having to hide everywhere he could in all these different places from caves to wilderness. So last week, Pastor Rod talked about an incident that ties in with today's uh, message and passage from 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 6, 6 through 23, and also Psalm 52, which was written about this incident. I'm just going to kind of highlight uh, this passage and read some of it. Now, you have to picture that last week, David had gone down to the city where these priests were and talked to a priest called Ahimelech, and he was asking for help, being a fugitive. And Ahimelech helped him. Now, while he was there, there was a man called Doeg that witnessed this, and he comes into play in today's passage. So you have to picture now, fast-forwarding to a little bit later, King Saul is sitting there outside of his tent with his big spear in his hand, and he's ranting and raving about how nobody cares about him, how people think David will be a better king than he was, and nobody's telling him about these conspiracies. And during this time, Doeg thought he'd win a few points with Saul and said, hey, Saul, guess what? I saw David down in this city of priests talking with Ahimelech, and, and Ahimelech helped him. He gave him food and also the sword of Goliath, the giant. Well, this set Saul off completely. He was so incensed that David was doing this, and he knew David was trying to kill him at this point. So... He sent for Ahimelech and all the priests to come to his camp, and King Saul was accusing them of conspiring and to try to plot against him. Why were you and David plotting against me, he says. Why did you give him bread and a sword so he can wait to kill me? Well, Ahimelech, being innocent, not knowing what was going on between David and Saul, defends himself and said, King Saul, I, I don't know what's going on with you and David. I, uh, don't press any charges against me and my family. We were not plotting to kill you. Well, as so often in life, when someone has made up their mind about someone else and uh, doesn't really want to hear the truth, King Saul didn't really care what Ahimelech said. And he, he ordered um, him to be killed, him and his whole family, to put to death. And then Saul gave orders to his guards to carry out the execution, but his guards wouldn't do it. And then, uh, if we refer to the first slide here, verse 18, the king ordered Doeg, the guy that had witnessed this down in the city, you go and strike the priests down. So Doeg went and struck them down. He killed 85 priests. Then he went to the city of Nob, where all these people were. He killed the men, women, and children and also destroyed the cattle, donkeys, and sheep. He wiped out every living thing. Whoa. Not exactly the coloring page you used to get in Sunday school class. This is a terrible incident. But there was one ray of, of good news in this. Abiathar, one of Ahimelech's sons, escaped the massacre. He went down and told David what had happened. And David said, Oh, I know when Doeg was there, when I was there before, I, I knew when I saw him that day, he was going to tell Saul. And David said, I am responsible for the death of all your relatives and all these people. Then, and I'm paraphrasing in my own way, what might have happened next and how it might have happened, but I can see David um, putting his arm around this young priest and saying, listen, Abiathar, I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is Saul wants to kill you. The good news is Saul wants to kill me too. So listen, just stay with me. I'll protect you. Don't be afraid. And he said something amazing. He said, you will be safe with me. And that phrase stuck out in my mind at the end of this passage that David 
Why would he say that? Why would he be safe, anybody be safe in David's presence with all this happening? You've got to think, Abiathar was wondering, well, I don't know, David. Saul's trying to kill you and he's trying to use you for a pincushion with his spears. I'm not sure I'm so safe with you. But he did stay with them. And we're going to talk a little about, bit of, today about where we feel safe. Where are we safe as Christians, especially spiritually? Uh, Diane and I were camping a couple of weeks ago, and it was getting twilight, a little bit dark. And, and uh, she said, Paul, why don't you go back to the car and then drive it back to the campsite? I'm going to continue walking through the woods here, and, and I'll meet you back there. And I, I said, well, I don't know. I don't feel comfortable. I, I think I should stay with you. And she said, do you feel like you need to protect me? And I said, well, yeah. I had my shorts on at that point, and she looked down and, and said, Paul, if anybody sees you limping with me with your bad leg and sees that big brace on your knee, they're going to think I'm easy pickings. I'm not so sure I'm any safer with you with me. And I'll have to admit, she had a good point. And it just brings up that idea to me, where are we safe? Who are we safe with, really? Do you know the most dangerous country in the world for Christians? Well, if you said North Korea, you're right. They are persecuted unmercifully there, and you take your life in your hands if you're a believer in North Korea. It's not a safe place, but there are Christians there. There are thousands of them who are trusting in God and not worried about their physical safety and not giving up their faith. Why would David say, you're safe with me? What was it about that? We're going to find out in a minute. And, you know, you might be wondering, and non-Christians might ask you, why is this horrific event even in the Bible? What can we get out of this passage? I thought the Bible was about gentle shepherds and Jesus picnicking in the park with children and picking lilies and stuff like that. Why is this even in there? Well, Here's what I think. I think so many of the stories in the Old Testament especially, and even the ones Jesus told, are about contrast. Contrasting those who live under the authority of God and are trying to do His will, and those that aren't. And this passage here, and in Psalm 52, we see the contrast very clearly. I'm just going to read a couple verses of Psalm 52. And David is referring back to this incident, and he's writing this psalm about Doeg, who did this horrible thing. He said, Your tongue is like a sharp razor, you worker of treachery. You love evil more than good. In contrast. You love words that devour, but God will break you down. He'll snatch you and tear you from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. Then the righteous shall see and fear and they shall see the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, who sought refuge in his wealth. There's Doeg, there's Saul, men who were not making God their refuge. And then the contrast in the next verse, David says, But I am like a green olive tree. In the house of God, I trust in the steadfast love of God forever. There's the contrast. Someone who's outside of God's refuge and someone who's taking refuge in it. That's why David could say to Abiathar, look, stay with me. Even though I'm on the run, wherever I am, I am taking refuge. I am protected by God Almighty. So it's really the most important decision in our life. Where will we take refuge? Where will we go for safety in our spiritual life? The kingdom of heaven or this world? Psalm 91 says, on the next slide, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, and under His wings you will find refuge. That's where we find our safety. So our Life truth today, the thing that, that struck me about this passage and the thing we can bring hope out of a tragic situation is we are spiritually safe when we take refuge in the stronghold of the Lord. 
Now listen, a, a stronghold, I like that word because it, um, it describes a place that's fortified to protect us against attack. And man, we are under attack in a lot of ways in this, in this culture, even in our own country. Not so much physically, but there's a lot of animosity toward Christians and traditional Christian beliefs. Um, just a couple weeks ago, the protesters in Portland, you can see on video, were burning Bibles in a fire. And it's sort of symbolic about some of the spiritual uh, struggle that's happening even now. So we need to be in our stronghold all the time to be able to, you know, fend against any kind of attacks in that way. As believers in Christ, if we make the Lord our stronghold, He is our safe place. Now, what is this, um, what are we protected from when we're in this stronghold? I want to bring out a couple of things, or probably many things, but one thing that for sure we are protected or safe from when we are in the, the stronghold of God is we are safe from the penalty of sin. Psalm 52 talks about Doeg being snatched out of his tent and uprooted. That's someone that's not in God's refuge. They will be subject to judgment and there's destruction ahead. People that are in Christ, that are taking God as a refuge, are safe from that. I remember when I was at uh, summer school back in Chicago a long time ago in college, uh, we were in the dorm or a classroom and there was a siren and there was a tornado that was lighting down right near us. And so we had to take refuge d down in the basement in order to avoid the destruction of the tornado. That's part of what refuge is to keep you safe from anything that's dangerous like that. I like what it says in Proverbs 10, 19. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. There's that contrast again. Safe, outside, destruction. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, when I read this, I think, whoa, I don't know, I don't think I'd call myself blameless. I'm not sure I could enter that stronghold. I blame myself for... For things, and I'm to blame for some stuff, big and small, in my life. But, but listen, when you're in Christ, when you're on the path of the Lord, you are blameless in His sight. Because remember what Paul said in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So we are blameless, not because we are perfect in our actions, but because of what Christ did. He took the blame on that cross. That's the reason he came, so that we would not have to take the blame for everything. He took it and bore it, and his resurrected life allows us to enter God's stronghold. Now there's a kind of a neat, uh, a lot of the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of what was to come in Christ. and There's physical things that are as spiritual application. Um, and one of them is, in the Old Testament, God had uh, the people of Israel set up cities of refuge. And there literally, there were six of them, I believe, and they were placed not too far from each other um, so people could go and not be subject to uh, someone that wanted revenge or if you accidentally killed somebody, it, it wasn't you know, intended murder, but you could go and if you got into that city, you were safe from punishment. No one could touch you there. It was literally a city of refuge, fortified walls that protected you. And it's sort of a type of Christ and us being in the city of refuge in our faith. And it was kind of neat to think of uh, the parallels there. The cities were appointed by God, and that's where our salvation comes from. It's not by human philosophy or something we make up. Um, Jesus said, the Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. The burden is not on us to save ourselves. He has provided a place of refuge. All we have to do is enter it. The cities were accessible even to non-Jews, which I thought was interesting when I read that. Anybody could come there. Just like the gospel is open to everybody. It doesn't matter race, creed, color, male, female, 
The gospel is open to every single person. God would have everybody come under his wings and be saved in that way. The cities uh, were, the roads were clear and they were literally well marked. They had signs, city of refuge this way, which I think is a a good reminder for the church uh, that we make sure that we are clear, pointing the way to salvation and clear the road that leads to to God's uh, refuge. And they were also, the roads were kept free of obstruction. Anything that fell on the road was moved away. The bridges were repaired regularly so that people could get there. That's a good reminder for us as individuals or as a church not to put obstructions or make it hard for people to come to the Lord. Oh, you need to do this and you, you can't really wear that and come to church or you get judgmental or uh, you have to do this and that before you, you can really enter. It's not up to us to put obstacles in the way. The roads were clear, well marked, and open. Anybody can come in the refuge of the Lord. We're protected from the penalty of sin. We're also protected from the burden of guilt. It says in Psalm 103:12, as far as east is from the west, He has removed our transgressions from us. Which means we don't have to carry the burden of guilt and sin with us. And it's hard not to. I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, things come up and you start thinking about stuff you did or didn't do, and you feel bad, and it can be a burden sometimes. Some people are terribly burdened with guilt and shame. Now, in this passage, David, at the time that Abiathar told him about this slaughter, he felt responsible. But when he wrote Psalm 52, you can see in the psalm, he did not blame himself at that point. He realized where the blame was. It was with Doeg and Saul. They're the ones that carried out the crimes. David didn't carry a burden of guilt with him very long. He realized, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have gone there. I... I feel bad, maybe I should have been more truthful, but it wasn't David that killed anybody. And so often we put the blame on ourselves and we carry it with us. David may have made a mistake, possibly going there and asking for help, but God didn't abandon him. That's such an important thing. I have a question for you. Do you can we be a true believer and not be true to our beliefs? Yes, I think it happens. I think the Bible is full of of people that were believers, that were used by God, that wanted to follow God, but occasionally weren't always true to those beliefs. But God didn't abandon them. Abraham, Moses, David, Peter in the New Testament made some terrible mistakes, but God didn't just say, "Well, well, okay, you're out. You know, you made a mistake. You're no longer in the, the kingdom. I can't use you. He didn't say that. I just finished the novel and the author said, um, described one character this way. She had a good moral compass, but sometimes the needle wavered. And that's what it's like sometimes. We are aimed toward God. We are walking on his path as best we can, but sometimes, you know, it's not always exactly true. But the good news is God doesn't kick us out of the stronghold the first time we make a mistake. We're not walking a tightrope. And the first time we, we get off, oh, it's too late. No, he doesn't abandon us. Now, a lot of people carry the guilt with them. Kind of like the suitcase here. Full of guilt and shame. Things they did wrong. Now, I've done that, and sometimes you, you open it up and you revisit it. Oh, man. Oh. oh, shoot. Oh, here's one. Yeah, I remember this. When I didn't, I could have done better here, and I'm, I feel guilty. And you put on this stained, guilty shirt. And I want to read um, from Zechariah 3, which has this illustration I thought was a nice visual illustration. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. 
And he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those that were standing with him, Joshua, t- take off those filthy clothes. See, the angel said, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. That's what God said to us. No, don't, don't carry around the guilt. Don't, don't put it on yourself. I've taken it away. Your stains have been cleaned through the blood of my son Christ. We don't need to wear it or feel it or carry it with us. David didn't curl up into a ball and said, oh, look what I did, and then uh, just sat there under a fig tree in the desert. He felt bad, he confessed, but then God was still using him. God takes away our sins. As far as the east is from the west, our sins are taken away from us. But you're saying, listen, listen, Mr. Preacher Man. Yeah, it's easy for you to say. But I still feel like sometimes I take one step forward and two back. I still feel guilty and shame sometimes. I'm not always faithful. Well, listen to what it says in Psalm 91. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield. When you start feeling down on yourself and realize you know, your weaknesses, which we all do, remember, it's his faithfulness that is our shield. We may, you know, kind of waver, go up and down a little bit, but God is always faithful to us, and He will never abandon us. We are protected from the burden of guilt, which frees us to live. We're also protected from being a slave to our old nature. Paul says, knowing this, That our old self was crucified with him so that we no longer would have to be slaves to sin. This is probably one of the hardest things, isn't it? We're in a battle with our old self. Even though we're if we're in Christ and we've we've taken him into our heart and we, we we want to live and mature in our faith, we still have to battle the old nature. Paul did. As faithful as he was, there's still that old nature, even though we've been renewed. But he said the love of Christ now controls us. We're not controlled by our old nature if we're living under the shelter of God's love. You know, um, if you think of, I like the idea of a fortress as well as a refuge. A fortress, if you think of us being in it, that's our new nature. And outside the fortress is our old nature. The more we are living and abiding in, our, in the fort, under God's shelter, that's letting that new nature take over and work in us and renew us and transform us. You know, the old nature is very deceptive. People have an amazing capacity to deceive themselves. Oh, you know, I'm not really as bad as those Old Testament guys. I kind of have things under control. I've made my plans and Everything's working out pretty good. That's sort of the old nature thinking I'm in charge, putting your refuge in your own plans. And boy, have those changed since COVID, huh? We've been awakened to see sometimes what we think is going to happen isn't going to. But humans can deceive themselves. There was a study that said 90% of drivers think they're better than the average driver. And 94% of professors at a certain college thought they were better than the average professor. They all thought they were better than everybody else. Well, somebody's deceiving themselves. They're not looking at themselves clearly and truthfully, which is easy to do. We don't always think, oh, I don't really need to change or examine myself. Uh, But that's really a deception. We do need to. Now Saul was deceiving himself about David, throwing out accusations and making up stuff in his mind. And and look at the stuff that Saul was doing and see if it resonates with some of what we do with our old self. He twisted what people were saying. Have you ever done that? People say stuff and you kind of twist it around, don't quite accurately quote it or understand it on purpose. We don't try to understand the other side of, of something. Saul certainly did with Ahimelech. He didn't care what Ahimelech had to say. He had his mind made up. You ever do that? 
you're not really willing to, to listen to the other side? How about looking for the negative in what people say and do? Pointing out all the things that people do to hurt us. Oh, look at that. Look, did you see what they did or they didn't do or what they said? They're not really being sensitive to me. That hurt. You get angry when your expectations aren't met with Saul. His expectations weren't being met, so he got angry. Have you ever done that? Yes, we all do it. Well, you know, all those things are part of our old nature. So we need to remember to stay in God's fortress. And I like the idea of a fortress because that helps us understand we can battle those things with the help of God's Spirit. Now, Saul had OCD, I believe, obsessive coveting disorder. He was coveting what David had. He wanted what other people had. And the minute we start doing that, we're not satisfied with what God's doing in our life. We're coveting other people's things or their talents or their looks. Any of that stuff is destructive in our relationship with God and each other. Somebody said, to be free from self-deception, we must love the truth, which means we must love God above all things. Those with undivided, undivided love for God are less likely to be distracted by other desires. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, we can learn a spiritual truth from the Brady Bunch this morning. Who'd have thought? Talk about distraction. I was reading about the Brady Bunch and when they were starting to put that together. And the producers um, were auditioning for the six roles of the kids in the Brady Bunch. Well, for those six roles, 260 kids turned out for the audition. So the producers were trying to figure out a way to kind of weed them out and speed up the, the interview process. So they were pretty clever. On the table, interview table in the room, the kids would come in. Off to the side a little bit, they'd put all kinds of colorful toys and games sitting there. And when a child would come in and interview, the interviewer would watch them. And if that the child's eyes would start glancing over to the toys and all that fun stuff during the interview, they were immediately dismissed. They didn't want kids that were distracted. They wanted people that were focused on what was, they were supposed to be doing. The world is very distracting. Our old nature can get seduced by a lot of that, but if we remain in God's fortress, we can battle that. We can triumph over those things. A fortress is a place that has, it's where the arsenal was, it's where the weapons were, it's where the supplies were. If you stayed in the fort during a siege, you were likely to, to survive. It's where all your help was. And we have weapons at our disposal as Christians. The fruits of the Spirit, you might think of them as, as spiritual weapons in a way. Love, patience, peace, kindness, self-control. Those are the things that help us to avoid giving in to our old nature. The more we let those things in our new nature out, then we can triumph. And that's part of staying in God's fortress. Now, in the middle of all this horrible uh, incident in 1 Samuel, there is something heroic that went on. And it's kind of glossed over and you may not have even caught it when I read it. I didn't really think about it at first, but the more I thought about it, remember when King Saul said to his uh, guards, I want you to kill Ahimelech and all the priests. Do it. And the guards said, no, we're not going to do it. That's pretty amazing when you think of it. Here's Saul with frothing at the mouth. He's got a spear in his hand. And his guards disobeyed him. His guards were, they were taking their life in their hands, but they were in God's stronghold. They knew right from wrong. They were not going to give in and do an evil act just because the world told them to. And it's a great example for us. 
It's not easy sometimes, but we need to stand firm in the fortress, in our shelter, and not listen to the world. Stay safe in there, and then God will honor that, and we can triumph over any of the temptations or any of the old nature that the world has. That's where we are safe. Now to kind of close here today, I wanted to, um, I don't know why, sometimes you know when you're, you're doing a study for a test, you, you kind of use the first letters of, of words to help you remember something. And um, In Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So we want to stay safe? Well, you might remember it this way, to spiritually abide in that fortress which is eternal. That's where we are safe in this world. That's where we are guaranteed to triumph because of what God has done through Christ. Let's pray. Lord, there's a, a lot of things that are scary out in the world. A lot of temptations, uh, spiritual attacks, uh, sometimes physical for Christians. And we, we just want to always acknowledge You as our Lord and, and stay under Your wings. Help us to remain in Your shelter, in Your fortress, so that we can feel safe. We can be at peace. And know that we can survive and triumph in our life no matter what comes our way. We thank you for what you've done. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.